I am the Health Education Project Specialist here at the Maxwell and Elmer Blum Patient Family Learning Center. I help manage all of our programs here. Please be aware that Mass General will be live streaming and recording this presentation for Mass General Safety and Privacy. They will not interview in the presentation in any way. If you're not comfortable asking a question out loud, feel free to write them on the card. You can either place them in the basket or raise your hand and I can collect them and I can ask the questions for you. So today we have Dr. Chiyo Yakose. She is a rheumatology fellow in the Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology at Mass Channel. And she is here today to give a talk on knee and hip arthritis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yakose. Thank you for the kind introduction. I am very happy and excited to be here to talk to you today about hip and knee arthritis. So I have no disclosures. And in terms of what we'll be covering, we'll be discussing you know, what is arthritis very broadly to begin so that we're all on the same page. We'll be discussing how common knee and hip arthritis is, what are the risk factors that predispose to it, what are the symptoms that we look for, um, how is it diagnosed, and then what can be done to manage the symptoms of hip and knee arthritis in particular. So broadly speaking, what is arthritis, right? We use the term fairly commonly both in medicine as well as in our day-to-day -day, you know, conversations with friends, family, et cetera. But what exactly does it mean? And so just so that we're all on the same page, if you look at the root of the word, arth means joint, and itis means pain or inflammation, so arthritis is a very broad kind of umbrella term that refers to anything that causes either joint pain and or inflammation. And so there are many subtypes of arthritis that we could potentially be discussing today. And so it's helpful to, again, define it and have a framework to think of the different types of arthritis. And one way that we as rheumatologists like to think of arthritis in particular, this is certainly you know, not the only way to think about it, but one way is to approach it um, as being either inflammatory arthritis or non-inflammatory arthritis. And the inflammatory types of arthritis, you know, we're referring to things like rheumatoid, psoriatic, crystalline such as gout or pseudogout, and connective tissue disease such as lupus and its um, cousins. And then, you know, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but these are kind of the typical examples of inflammatory arthritis. And in terms of non-inflammatory arthritis that we most commonly see, we're referring to a type of arthritis called osteoarthritis. And because osteoarthritis is the most common and predominant form of arthritis, uh, for the remainder of this talk, I'll be focusing mostly on osteoarthritis of the hip and knee, and uh, also be using the terms osteoarthritis and arthritis kind of interchangeably, but just recognize that there are other types of arthritis that are possible. So what exactly is osteoarthritis? Sometimes it's referred to as OA for short. It's, again, the most common form of arthritis overall that we encounter, and its hallmark feature is one of cartilage breakdown. And so here you have a picture of a normal joint, which is where kind of two bones articulate and meet each other. And you have this cartilage that lines the surface of the bones and provides this kind of cushioning and lubrication and allows the bones to move smoothly against one another. And in osteoarthritis, you have breakdown of that cartilage as a primary feature so that you could end up with a joint that looks like this, where you have breakdown in the cartilage, which is the white here, leading to loss of joint space narrowing. And sometimes, you know, you may have heard someone refer to having kind of bone-on-bone -bone arthritis in their knee, for example. And that's a sequelae of the loss of cartilage that's occurred in that joint. Other features that you can see are osteophytes, which are these kind of bony projections at the joint margins, and then subchondral sclerosis and cysts, which are basically bony changes that can take place at the surface of the bone as a result of the cartilage breakdown. So how common is it? An estimated 27 million adults in the United States have osteoarthritis of the hands, hips, and knees. These are the three most common places where patients tend to get osteoarthritis. The number of patients diagnosed with arthritis rises sharply after the age of 50, and it tends to level off after age 70 or so. 
in this Johnston County Osteoarthritis Project, which was a community-based longitudinal um, project to try to understand better you know, what is osteoarthritis, who gets affected by osteoarthritis. Um, they did a big survey of you know, thousands of patients and found that about a third of all participants over the age of 45 had hip arthritis and a, a similar percentage of patients also reported having knee arthritis. So you can tell, you know, up to a third of patients over age 45. So that's a lot of patients that are affected by these two conditions. And some have both, unfortunately. So this is a, a graph that kind of depicts this um, pictorially. And so on the left-hand column here, you have men. Here you have women. And then the top two panels refer to OA prevalence, which is at any given time, what you know, percentage or proportion of patients have been diagnosed with osteoarthritis, regardless of whether they've had it for a year or 20 years. And then the bottom panels show a related um, figure, which is the incidence, which is the, um, the patients who are newly diagnosed with osteoarthritis at any given age, which is along the x-axis here. And then the different lines refer to um, different joints. And so the orangest line up here refers to the DIP joint, which is the most distal kind of knuckle in your hand. The blue lines refer to the knee, the green uh, refers to the hip joint, and then the beige grayish color refers to the hand overall, which of course is made up of multiple smaller joints. And you can see that regardless of whether you're looking at the top panel or the bottom panel, men or women, really age 50 or so is where the slopes of the line start to go up dramatically. And as I mentioned previously, around 70 or so is when things start to plateau or level mm -hmm. off. You can see that um, in women, especially with certain joints more than others, the slope starts to go up even a little bit earlier between the ages of 40 and 50. So why do we care about osteoarthritis other than the fact that it's so very common? We care because it can lead to a lot of pain, which then can lead to disability and limited function, patients not being able to do the activities that they used to enjoy or that they need to do on a day-to-day. -day. Loss of productivity, it can be associated with a lot of healthcare costs, doctor's visits, etc. It can have a negative impact on mood and mental health because you know, you're not able to exercise or do the activities that you enjoy, get out of the house to see your friends, et cetera, without having to put up with the pain in your joints. And this is a little bit controversial, but there have been some reports that osteoarthritis can be associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, um, whether that's related to you know, not being able to be as physical as you would have been without the arthritis or some unrelated factor remains to be um, clarified, but there has been this association. So moving on, what are the risk factors for hip and knee arthritis? And I think when we're talking about risk factors, it's helpful to think of them as person level risk factors versus joint level risk factors. And I'll give examples of both, but basically person level risk factors are that risk factors that can increase your risk of osteoarthritis of basically any joint, not necessarily the hip versus the knee, for example. Whereas joint level risk factors are certain features that may increase your risk for knee arthritis in particular that may not be as relevant for hip or hand osteoarthritis, for example. So starting with personal level risk factors, for example, <coughs> Older age, as I mentioned, is a big risk factor. And you know, unfortunately, this is not something that you can do anything about, but that's certainly one of the biggest risk factors that we see. Similarly, female sex has been associated with both a higher prevalence as well as severity of symptoms related to arthritis. So if you'll recall back to that kind of line graph, you saw that the female slope seemed to um, increase even a little bit earlier than men. And that's certainly something that we see in you know, our clinics as well, oftentimes. Um, obesity, I consider to be um, a personal level risk factor. It may be kind of intuitive for knee osteoarthritis, which 
for which there's the strongest association between obesity and arthritis because it is a weight-bearing joint. You can imagine if you're carrying around a lot of extra pounds for many, many decades, that may put undue force and stress on the new joint, predisposing to knee OA. But the reason I put it as a person level risk factor is that even for the hands, for example, which is really not a weight-bearing joint, you know, how big a patient is shouldn't really have an impact on how much stress is placed on the hand joints. But even um, there's been studies that have shown a link between obesity and hand OA. And so that's the reason I put it as a personal level risk factor, whether it has to do with you know, inflammation related to obesity, um, the exact mechanisms are not yet clearly identified, but it's certainly a big risk factor that, that we try to do something about, and I'll talk more about that once I get to the management section. And genetics, so the heritable component of osteoarthritis is estimated to be around 40 to 50%. The association is stronger for hand and hip osteoarthritis than it is for the knee. And so if you know a patient had a mom or a dad who had really bad debilitating you know, arthritis in the hand, you know, chances are slightly higher that they may also suffer from those symptoms when they're older. But there are other things that we can um, intervene upon and do to try to manage those symptoms. Moving on to joint level risk factors. These are things like occupation, physical activity, and injury, which are kind of interrelated with one another. And so for example, <clears throat> you know, if you have a more physically strenuous job and you're on the floor kneeling all of the time, like laying down floors or something like that, studies have shown that those um, <coughs> certain occupational, you know, exposures or risk factors can increase your risk for knee osteoarthritis. <coughs> if you have a job that requires a lot of repetitive movements and manual dexterity, maybe there's some suggestion that it leads to an increased risk of hand osteoarthritis. Injury, um, especially for the knee, for example, you know, young athletes or you know, people that participate in sports for a hobby may be predisposed to meniscal or ACL ligamentous injuries in the knee, and that has been associated with an increased risk of developing knee osteoarthritis um, later down. Muscle strength um, is somewhat related, but it can be a joint level risk factor. For example, if you have very weak thigh muscles for whatever reason and may not stabilize that knee joint very well, it may increase your risk for developing arthritis and having more severe symptoms related to arthritis. Joint alignment, similarly, um, and leg length discrepancy. This is especially true for knee osteoarthritis. And so if one leg is much longer or shorter than the other, and you let it go kind of uncorrected for many years, that can also, you know, partly due to differences in muscle strength and joint alignment, that can also lead to problems with arthritis down the, down the road. And then bone and joint morphology. This is more true for hip arthritis than it is for the knee or the hand. Um, but there can, whether it's congenital or due to some other reason, if you know, the morphology and the alignment is just a little bit off and it's not corrected, um, that can also be a joint level risk factor for developing arthritis in the future. So moving on to symptoms, I'll start off by talking about <coughs> symptoms of hip osteoarthritis first. And so this is the hip joint. This is kind of your pelvic bone here, you have your tailbone here, you have your thigh bone here. And then the hip joint is kind of a ball and socket type joint. And so you have the ball here, which fits into the recess within the pelvic bone. And again, this area is covered by cartilage and there's fluid and other structures, support structures that provide um, integrity to the joint and allow it to move in all different directions because the hip joint has a very wide range of motion. Um, but in terms of pain, so again, the pathology tends to be kind of in this area here where the ball meets the socket. And so the most common symptom is pain, and in terms of location, 
most typically patients describe pain kind of in the deep anterior, so the front kind of groin area. It can involve or radiate to the lateral uh, hip or down further in the thigh or even in the buttock or lower back area. But there are other structures in those areas that can also give you problems like bursa, which are kind of fluid filled shock absorbers and other joints in the back as well. And so it is important to try to distinguish where exactly the pain is originating from and whether anatomically it makes sense for us to attribute that to hip arthritis as opposed to some, some other um, you know, ligamentous injury or something like that. In hip arthritis, it can often be unilateral, but plenty of people have bilateral symptoms as well. And symptoms may be worsened by rising from a seated position and in the initial phases of ambulation. Uh, patients will often report stiffness and restricted movement. They're not as flexible as they were, you know, once before, things like that. And then there should generally be no visible swelling, redness, or form. Part of that is because if there's, you know, very prominent redness or form, that's when we start thinking of the inflammatory types of arthritis that I mentioned earlier. And partly because <coughs> The hip is a deeper joint, and so we're just not able to visibly see any swelling, redness, or warmth that affects the um, hip joint. Moving on to the knee, so again, starting with a little bit of anatomy, you have the thigh bone coming down here, which meets the shin bones down here, and then you have the patella or the kneecap here as well, and then uh, Again, the, the white is the cartilage that is supposed to be kind of the you know, cushion or shock absorber. The knee joint is often um, divided into the medial and lateral compartments. So the medial compartment is the inside of the knee, and then the lateral is the outside. And the most common places where arthritis tends to affect the knee joint is where the, the thigh bone and the patella meet up here in the front of the knee or on the medial or the inside aspect of the knee joint. So again, the most common symptoms is pain. Often it's in the front of the knee or again on the inside of the knee. And knee osteoarthritis, more often than hip, tends to affect both joints. Um, and symptoms may be worsened by prolonged sitting, getting up from a very low chair, as well as stairs or inclines, and especially patients seem to have more symptoms when they're going down as opposed to going up. The knee joint, um, when it's affected with osteoarthritis, we can sometimes observe some swelling, and uh, that's partly because the knee joint is a superficial joint, and so we're better able to just see and catch the swelling more easily when we're examining a patient in the clinic. But again, redness and warmth, although it can be present you know, to a minor degree, it really shouldn't be a prominent feature of osteoarthritis. And if someone has like a really big, red, angry looking knee, we start to think of other causes such as you know, gout or pseudogout, for example, which can certainly affect or coexist with osteoarthritis as well. So how is arthritis diagnosed? So there isn't you know, any sort of one uh, magic test that allows doctors to diagnose osteoarthritis. We just collect a lot of information, as much information as we can, and uh, you know, perspective a little bit and see if the whole picture kind of fits with osteoarthritis. And so if you were to see a physician, whether that be your primary care doctor, a rheumatologist, orthopedist, sports medicine doctor, for a question of osteoarthritis, these are the types of things that we may ask. You know, when did the symptoms start? Was it sudden onset? Have you been having symptoms for a long time? Where exactly do you have symptoms? And often we'll try to be very specific and you know, ask, can you point with one <coughs> finger where you're having the most pain? Uh, do symptoms get better or worse with activity? Or osteoarthritis pain typically um, gets worse with activity, although there can be this kind of brief, transient gelling or stiffness when you're first getting up to do something for the first time. 
And then have you noticed any swelling, redness, or stiffness? We'll certainly do an examination to try to localize the size of the, uh, the site of the pain. Again, we'll look at joint alignment. We'll test your active and passive range of motion. And so we'll ask you how much you can move the hip or the knee joint on your own. And then we'll ask you to let us do all the work and kind of relax and see how much we're able to maneuver their joint as well. Uh, because we're talking about the lower extremity joints for this talk today, we will pay a lot of attention to how you're walking. <coughs> and then we always assess the adjacent joints because everything is kind of connected, right? And so if you're having knee pain, is it because the pain is, you know, the, the problem originates in the knee or is it because you're, you know, compensating for a bad ankle or a bad hip, for example? <coughs> One word about radiographs. Often we will obtain just plain x-rays to help us in the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. And plain x-rays are usually sufficient to, to give us enough information to be able to say whether we think your pain is due to osteoarthritis or not. Fancier imaging modalities like CT scans or MRIs are often not necessary unless we're suspecting some sort of associated injury of you know, a ligament or something like that, which is not well visualized on an x-ray and better caught on an MRI, for example. But generally speaking, x-rays are our first go-to and often we'll just stop there. However, it's important to keep in mind that the degree of x-ray findings do not necessarily correspond with the degree of symptoms. And so, you know, sometimes we'll see patients in our clinic who seem to have really, really debilitating pain that we think is from their arthritis, but we get their x-rays. And, you know, while they do have some of the changes of osteoarthritis, it's, you know, not as bad as someone else who could have, you know, almost bone on bone, but are um, actually not as debilitated by the pain. So there is this kind of discrepancy. In terms of what we might see on an x-ray, this is an x-ray of the hip. This is normal. And so again, you have the pelvic bones up here, you have the thigh bone here, you have the ball and socket here. And you can see that the contour of the bone on both sides is fairly smooth. There's no jagged ends or anything like that. And then you see this fairly smooth kind of linear black strip. Um, which is the cartilage and the joint space, and that's pretty well preserved. And here is an abnormal x-ray, and so again, the thigh bone, pelvic bone, the ball and uh, socket joint, but again, here you can see that the contours are a little bit fuzzier, it looks more jagged, um, and this kind of black strip here, which we saw very nicely over here, is a little bit irregular and narrowed. And so those, these are pretty typical findings of hip osteoarthritis on an x-ray. Similarly, in the knee, you have the thigh bone coming down here, the shin bones down here. This is the inside of the knee. This is the outside of the knee. And again, you can see that the contours um, of the bones are pretty smooth, and it almost looks like they're floating on each other because you have that healthy cartilage and that joint space which is preserved. However, when you get to pretty bad osteoarthritis, you can see, now this side is the inside of the knee, this is the outside, but you can see more so on the inside half of the knee, the contours of the bones are more kind of jagged and compared to this, you can see that the joint space is very much narrowed and it's almost approaching kind of bone on bone where the bones are touching each other. And you can imagine that that might cause a lot more pain when you're bearing weight on your knees as opposed to someone who has a knee x-ray that looks like this. Any questions so far? Yes. What is the cartilage made of? Cartilage is made of um, a bunch of different proteins, um, which I'll get to as a part of the some of the management of arthritis. And, um, you know, just kind of shock absorbers and fluid and things like that. Can it be regenerated? Uh, so as of right now, there isn't any treatment that we can offer to our patients that uh, regenerates or, you know, um, does the damage that's 
been incurred as a part of osteoarthritis. Yes. Um, I've heard a lot about stem cell. Uh huh. Would that help if you're bone on bone on your knees? It hasn't um, been definitively proven to be helpful yet. So moving on to the management. Um, I like to think of the management of hip and knee arthritis as either non-pharmacologic or pharmacologic, but it's important to keep in mind that often we employ both simultaneously. And so examples of non-pharmacologic therapies are land and water-based exercises, weight loss, which I'll be talking about in more detail in a few slides, and then some adjunctive therapies such as acupuncture, thermotherapy, which includes either cold or cold or heat therapy, and then assistive devices, orthotics, and braces, especially if one of the risk factors that I mentioned before, such as joint alignment or leg length discrepancy, is at play in that particular patient's scenario. And then in terms of the pharmacologic therapies, there's you know, several to choose from, and I'll be talking about each of them you know, briefly as we continue, but they include things like NSAIDs, non-steroidal, and inflammatory medications, acetaminophen or Tylenol, <coughs> topical agents, pills, and then injections as well. And again, often a multimodal approach is key. So starting with some of the non-pharmacologic therapies, one of the most important um, and beneficial things that a patient can incorporate to manage their symptoms of arthritis is exercise. Um, Land-based exercises, which can include you know, things as simple as walking, can benefit both hip and knee osteoarthritis and result in improvement in both pain and function. The primary goal is to improve muscle around the affected joint so that you're less symptomatic. Again, you know, unfortunately, there's nothing that we can offer the, to reverse the joint damage that you might see on an x-ray, but we can do things to help mitigate some of the symptoms. Physical therapy is an option for many patients, and I do refer many of my patients for you know, a six or eight week course of physical therapy, but the important thing to remember is that long-term adherence is important, and so I've had patients you know, participate in two months of physical therapy, they learn all these exercises, they feel great while they're going, but then as soon as that ends, they stop doing the exercises at home and then they kind of revert back. And so I like to think of physical therapy as um, kind of an educational tool for patients as well, where they can learn how to safely do the targeted exercises that help with whatever is hurting them the most. And then, um, it's really important for the patient to recognize, though, that it doesn't end there and that the physical therapy is meant to teach them the exercises that they can often continue doing at home. Usually the exercises don't require any fancy equipment or anything like that. And there are things that you can do, you know, 20, 30 minutes every morning. Yes? On one of your earlier sl slides, I saw glucosamine. Yes. Um, that is available. <coughs> I, I was taking glucosamine yes. and I didn't know why. Yes. And um, so I stopped it. I was told that yes. it didn't have any effect. And that's one of the components of cartilage, and I'll have a slide on glucosamine a, a little bit later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, related to the land based exercises, often patients find that water based exercise programs to be helpful as well. And the main reason for that is, is that it's very low impact. And so if someone has very bad arthritis symptoms, they're not you know, normally physically active, they're kind of still getting into the swing of moving their bodies. Water-based exercise programs can be a great place to start and they can work their way up to incorporate um, more land-based exercises as well. Weight loss, so this is also something that's very important for arthritis patients that are overweight or obese. And I mentioned obesity um, as a personal level risk factor for arthritis. This is um, you know, achieved, primary, achieved through a combination of dietary changes and physical activity. And studies have shown that even modest weight loss can lead to an improvement in osteoarthritis symptoms. 
So even as little as ten, losing 10% 10 of your body weight, if you know an individual is, again, overweight or obese, can result in improvements in the symptoms of both knee and hip osteoarthritis. So hypothetically speaking, if you have a patient that's 5'8 and 210 pounds, we use this number called the BMI or body mass index, which is basically a ratio of your weight and your height. That individual would be you know, classified as being obese because his BMI is 31. Anything 30 and higher is considered obese. And if this patient were to try to get to a normal weight, a BMI of 25 or less, he or she would have to lose 50 pounds, which seems like a lot of weight. And so that, you know, just being told that number when you're at a doctor's office can seem very daunting and may even discourage some patients from even attempting to take that first step. However, as I mentioned, only 10% of your body weight, losing only 10% of your body weight can still lead to improvement in both knee and arthritis and so that would be about 20 pounds which is still you know a sizable amount of weight but it looks much looks and sounds much more doable than being told that you have to lose 50 pounds and so if this, indi oops, if this individual were to lose 20 pounds his BMI would you know it's better than 31 it goes down to 29 which is still in the overweight range but that alone is you know a tremendous first step in trying to get your arthritis symptoms under better control, and any amount of weight loss is going to have other beneficial effects, such as improving your cardiovascular health as well. Okay. And so moving on to um, the pharmacologic therapies, again, the goal first and foremost is to control your pain, um, partly so that you can participate in the land-based, water-based exercises and do the things that you enjoy doing. And so there are two first-line agents that we like to recommend for our patients. One is topical non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in the US. That would be a topical diclofenac or Voltaren gel, which unfortunately is only available with a prescription. But as you might imagine, because it's a gel, it has a very good safety profile and it can be very effective. The drawbacks to the topical NSAID is that you know, you do tend to have to apply multiple times a day. I typically tell my patients up to four times a day you can apply the gel. And there can be some issues with joint penetration. So for knee arthritis, it tends to work pretty well because again, it's a more superficial joint and the medication is able to kind of penetrate better. But it may not work as well for hip arthritis, for example, precisely because it is a deeper and bigger joint. And then this, the other first line agent that we like to recommend is acetaminophen or Tylenol. Again, it has a very good safety profile and because osteoarthritis tends to affect older patients who may be on multiple other medications or have heart disease, kidney disease, other medical problems, Tylenol tends to be you know, the safest best bet in terms of the, your initial pain medication. The con, the drawback is that it is likely less effective than NSAIDs. Um, however, again, its safety profile is pretty hard to beat. And I often tell my patients that taking it consistently, so you can take Tylenol you know, up to three times a day, even if your pain is not that severe, having some of the medication in your system kind of 24 seven can help minimize your need for other breakthrough medications. So that's an approach that we'll sometimes use. Other options for pain control, I'll touch on each of them briefly. Oral non steroidals topical capsaicin, opioids, and duloxetine. So oral NSAIDs are things like, you know, the ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, naproxen, Aleve, all available, or most of them available over the counter and very readily accessible. So admittedly, it is the most commonly used treatment for osteoarthritis, even though it's not necessarily, it may not necessarily be our first one. The pros are that it's more effective than Tylenol and readily accessible. You don't have to wait to get in to see a doctor, wait for a prescription to you know, take, a, take a pill of Advil at home when you're having severe pain. The major drawback is that it comes with significant toxicities, especially with regular use. And so here are all the possible NSAID side effects. 
that I have to warn all my patients about. It can affect multiple organs, starting with the kidney. It can cause kidney injury and failure, elevated blood pressure, fluid retention, electrolyte abnormalities. In the lungs, it's rare, but it can cause bronchospasms, kind of asthma-like symptoms in susceptible individuals. GI is a big one, so often patients will report upset stomach, acid reflux symptoms. It can cause stomach ulcers with prolonged use, as well as bleeding from the stomach or any really anywhere else in the GI tract is possible. Heart is a big one. Um, increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Again, elevated blood pressure. And while it probably doesn't cause heart failure in someone who never had heart failure before, if someone um, already has heart failure and you take NSAIDs, you have fluid retention, it can precipitate a heart failure exacerbation body as well. And so while you know here and there use you know for very severe pain is probably permissible, we really get worried about it every single day, multiple times a day. Topical capsaicin is another um, gel or cream that's actually derived from the chili pepper extract. This is available over the counter. And the way it works is that it depletes chemicals at the nerve ends that transmit that pain sensation up to the brain. Um, again, because it's topical, it has a good safety profile. The side effects are pretty minimal, limited to some local skin irritation. Um, the cons are similar as well in terms of requiring multiple applications and issues with joint penetration if you're trying to use it for a deeper joint. Some patients really seem to love capsaicin and others really just hate the sensation of the burning that it gives them. And so they'd rather live with the OA pain than, than try this, but it is a safe option that can be considered. One word about opioids, it's generally avoided and to be honest, not, not often needed in the treatment of osteoarthritis pain. You know, I can never say never in medicine, so it can be considered in certain scenarios. For example, if you have someone who has kind of, you know, end stage osteoarthritis, they're having knee replacement surgery in a month and they really need to get up and do something um, some patients will be prescribed opioids for a very, very short period of time, but generally we try to avoid it. Um, it is a potent painkiller, but actually many studies have shown that it's no more effective than taking NSAIDs, and it has many side effects, including sedation, drowsiness, increased risk of falls, constipation, and of course in this day and age, it's, you, know, you can't ignore the habit-forming property of opioids. Um, and so it's generally something that we try to stay away from as much as possible. And duloxetine is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Its primary indications are actually for depression and anxiety. And so there may be, you know, there's many, many patients who have no suggestion of osteoarthritis who are on these medications for their mood disorders. However, it's also been studied and approved for the treatment of fibromyalgia, which is kind of a neuropathic pain disorder, as well as chronic musculoskeletal pain. And the OA indication kind of fits under this chronic musculoskeletal pain umbrella. It's, it has modest efficacy for knee, more so than hip OA. Um, and because it is a medication that can be used to treat depression and anxiety, it should be used in caution in those who have an existing history of depression or anxiety because sometimes it can paradoxically worsen those mood disorders. And so if I have a patient who's already on a different antidepressant or has a strong history, I um, tend to let their psychiatrist or mental health provider um, discuss this as an option for both their mood and their osteoarthritis for them, but I tend not to be the one managing it because I don't want to interfere with um, their underlying mood disorder. And this does need to be used long term to achieve benefit, and so it's by no means meant to be a rescue medication the way you might take you know, an extra pill of ibuprofen or something, but if it's tolerated and there are no other contraindications, and especially if a patient has multiple areas of joint pain, not just one or two, this can be a reasonable <coughs> option to consider. Um, so here is the glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate slide. Um, so again, 
you know, the, the issue we said with osteoarthritis <laughs> primarily starts with the cartilage, and both are components of cartilage which is meant to line and cushion the joints. And multiple studies have investigated the effects of both glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate in both knee and hip OA in terms of both pain as well as joint and cartilage structure. And in terms of pain, unfortunately, the, the vast majority of studies say that it's no better than placebo, which is basically taking a sugar pill. And then in terms of joint structures, there's been some conflicting evidence, and some studies suggested that maybe chondroitin, but not glucosamine, may have a very, very small benefit in terms of kind of maintaining that integrity of the cartilage, but that difference is probably too small for it to be clinically meaningful and appreciable by the patient. And so while it's probably safe, and a lot of people you know, do try it on their own, they'll find it at the pharmacy, um, they'll hear about it from a friend, they'll try it. You know, I don't necessarily say, tell them that you shouldn't be on it, but I do let them know what the studies have shown. Um, especially because these supplements, unlike medications that you get from the pharmacy, are not as strictly regulated, and they can also be pretty expensive. And so I'd rather have you spending your money on something that's you know, been proven in studies to be effective, as opposed to going out to um, spend all your money on these supplements. But some patients do, do want to try it. Um, a word on intraarticular injections. So these are up to here were kind of either pills or topicals that you could use for arthritis. We can also, if it's one joint that's kind of hurting out of proportion to the rest, we can also try to target that one joint in the form of a joint injection. Um, one form is to inject hyaluronic acid in an approach called visco supplementation. And the idea behind that is that hyaluronic acid is a component of the joint fluid that we all have to varying degrees, and it, again, cushions the joint to a certain extent and provides lubrication. Um, there's actually, unfortunately, no robust evidence of the hyaluronic acid injections working any better than a placebo injection, and they tend to be rather expensive, although you know, often we can get insurance to cover it. And so generally speaking, it's not um, widely recommended to all patients with osteoarthritis. However, if they've already tried a lot of these other therapies and they're having really debilitating pain that's just in one knee out of proportion to the rest, you know, we may try it once, see if it works. If that first injection uh, doesn't work, I tend not to repeat it. But some patients, um, do feel that it, it gives them benefit. Whether that's any more than placebo, it's, it's hard to know. And then um, the other uh, joint injection that we can offer is in the form of steroids, which are just kind of potent anti-inflammatory medications. It does seem to provide mild to moderate pain relief, but it is short-lived, and often it lasts about six weeks or so. And serial injections can be associated with risks, including uh, possibly accelerated cartilage loss and thinning and weakening of other tissues, such as the skin, the muscles, um, ligaments, things like that. And so while I offer steroid injections to some of my osteoarthritis patients, um, I tend not to offer it any more frequently than every three months because of the risks of um, you know, accelerating that cartilage loss and possibly injuring or um, leading to kind of the breakdown of other surrounding tissues. But um, if, again, they've tried a lot of other options, they're not a candidate for hip replacement or they're not yet ready for a joint replacement, you know, steroids can be something that to consider. Um, in terms of how it's uh, done, knee injections are actually fairly simple and can be done very quickly just in the office will sterilize the area. The needle is no bigger than one that you would use for a regular blood draw. And then we just kind of feel around for the landmarks of the knee joint and mm -hmm. put the needle in and inject the medication. The hip joint is, a, again, a deeper joint. There's bigger blood vessels and nerves and other structures that can potentially be damaged by just jabbing a needle in there blindly. And so hip injections, if someone does choose to pursue them, are often done 
with visual guidance, meaning a provider that uses ultrasound or interventional radiology to make sure that it's getting to the right area. And then lastly, surgery. So surgery remains an option for patients with refractory osteoarthritis symptoms of both the hip and the knee, and it's actually very effective for both. And so this is an example of a patient who's actually had bilateral hip replacements. And so you can tell you know, what, what the prostheses look like relative to her native bones and their screws and things like that here. Um, however, other types of surgeries that are sometimes considered or offered to patients, such as arthroscopic lavage and debridement, which is when an orthopedist orthopedic surgeon will make a small incision and kind of wash out the joint and get rid of all the debris and muck that's kind of accumulated in that joint. It's generally not recommended because it can, um, it doesn't seem to help in terms of symptoms and it may also accelerate um, the need for an eventual hip or knee replacement. Um, that being said, orthopedic referral should occur before functional limitation or severe pain occurs. And so even if you don't anticipate needing or having to undergo hip replacement or knee replacement for a while, it never hurts to you know, go meet an orthopedist, orthopedic surgeon when you're still feeling relatively well and talk about the timing and the risks and the benefits and what you can do to try to you know, prolong that, um, you know, even if it's something that's anticipated down the line, to try to prolong that period where you can go without having to undergo joint and there are some um, considerations for delaying surgery in very, very young patients. And so typically that's less than 60 years old. And the reason for that is that, you know, even though these prosthetic joints are very good and can last many, many years, it does tend to have a finite lifespan. And so if we were to replace you know, a joint in a 40 year old, which unfortunately sometimes happens because they have something congenital or they had a bad car accident or something like that. But if we were to replace the joint in a 40 year old, chances are relatively high that they would then need a revision several you know, decades down the line. And revision surgeries uh, tend to be associated with less favorable outcomes. And so we, if at all possible, we, tr only, we try to replace a joint only once and that timing is um, you know, a joint discussion between you know, your primary or your rheumatologist or whoever is managing your arthritis, as well as the orthopedist, orthopedist surgeon and the patient, of course. So in summary, osteoarthritis of the knee and hip are unfortunately very common. It can lead to pain, dysfunction, and reduced quality of life. There are multiple personal level and joint level risk factors for osteoarthritis, some of which are modifiable, such as age. Others, unfortunately, are not, such as genetics, age. But osteoarthritis, at least the symptoms of it, can be managed. It's important to approach it with a combination of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies. And the goal is, again, pain management and preserving function. and. Uh, you know, allowing the patient to continue to participate in all the activities that bring them joy. And knee and hip replacement surgery is an option in severe and end-stage osteoarthritis <coughs> of both the hip and the knee. we will just draining the fluid will help patients feel better and so if you can get in to see you know a doctor that can do that procedure for you that can reduce the swelling dramatically very quickly and then otherwise um, I wouldn't approach the, the management any differently whether you have swelling or not I think a lot of the you know topical NSAID style and all things like that are still helpful in the management of pain um, but some, we do have some people come in, you know, just to get the fluid drained with or without, you know, a steroid injection or something like but that. nothing you could do on your own. I mean, you can, you know, it may or may not resolve on its own depending on how bad the swelling is, yeah. Does ice help? Ice can help. Yeah. 
Yes, ice or heat can help. It's kind of patient preference. A lot of patients with bad hand go away, like heat, but for knee and you know for the knees, for example, some people prefer ice. Yes, I have two questions. Oh, sorry. No, no, two questions. Um, so you therapy I don't think is one of the ones that I mentioned, but it still remains very much kind of experimental, and so it's not something that I routinely recommend to all of my patients. What is it exactly? It, um, I think it's similar to kind of along the veins of kind of stem cell therapy, but I'm not too familiar with it ourselves because, again, it's not something that we offer here, um, and it's not there's not a whole lot of evidence behind it yet. And then the second question is, how long do replacements last for hip and knee? So it can often last um, several decades, um, which is why, you know, if someone gets a hip replacement at age 70, chances are, you know, that'll last them, you know, basically for the remainder of their life. But if someone has it at age 40, hopefully they have many, many decades to live and then they may need a revision. Yes. Um, I would like to know how does the Christina, please can hear your question. Uh, how does the Clotinac work? It's like covered uh, eliminate symptoms or it's uh, do something for cartridge, maybe it's filled. How does diclofenac work? Yeah. Okay, so the diclofenac is just a topical anti-inflammatory, yeah. so it doesn't affect the cartilage at all, but it can help reduce your symptoms. Well, of okay. the is there any correlation between uh, osteoarthritis of, of the knee or hip and uh, blood clots in the leg? Um, generally speaking, no. If a patient is so debilitated by it yeah. that they're bed bound, that can be a risk factor for blood clots. And then if they do undergo hip or knee replacement, you know, those types of orthopedic surgeries are another big risk factor for blood clots after you've had the procedure, but just having, you know, kind of none of the mill osteoarthritis wouldn't, I, be. wouldn't concern yeah. to be a risk factor for blood clots. Yes. How, um, how frequent um, would a redo on a knee replacement, uh, how frequent is appropriate, or is it appropriate to have a redo on a hip or a knee replacement? Um, so I think it, it's kind of a case-by-case -case scenario, and I'm not an orthopedist surgeon, so I don't know if they have kind of a specific threshold or a number. I generally have seen patients maybe get it once, but no more than once, unless there was some sort of, you know, more dramatic, like, prosthetic failure or something like that. But yeah, unfortunately, I think that's a better question for someone who actually performs the procedure. Yeah. I have a few questions from the audience. Sure. Um, you talked about physical activity. Yes. Does it have to be weight bearing or can you do spin classes and get the same result? So I think um, a combination of both is helpful. I do think that weight bearing activities are, are often helpful to because part of the issue is that there's kind of muscle atrophy and weakening. But you know, spin may be able to kind of provide um, a similar level of benefit in terms of muscle strengthening as well. And so I think, you know, oftentimes a combination is helpful so that you don't overdo one type of exercise versus another. And it also depends on the type of uh, non-weight bearing activity. And then um, do bones crave a certain mineral or vitamin such as calcium, phosphorus, iron, magnesium? So all of them are helpful for general bone health, but as it pertains to osteoarthritis, um, you know, we don't routinely recommend like, you know, doubling up on calcium or anything like that to prevent the osteoarthritic changes. Again, because a lot of the, the disease starts at the cartilage and not the bone, the bone is kind of secondary. Um, some patients, um, because it sounds kind of similar, get osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. 
kind of confused. Osteoporosis, definitely calcium, magnesium, phosphorus are very important, but that's a disease that is associated with weakness of the bone and fragility fractures, whereas osteoarthritis is a, is a similar sounding but different process altogether. And then one more question. You talked about um, the hip and the knee, but how about arthritis in the hands? Are treatments similar, yes. same, different? So um, treatments are similar. And I think later on there is a talk on yes. hand osteoarthritis <laughs> here. Um, but uh, the treatments are similar. You know, the topical agents, again, the joints of the hand are pretty superficial, so it can be pretty effective. You know, all the pain agents that I mentioned can be effective for whatever reason. Um, the duoxetine, which is kind of the more nerve neuropathic medication, tends to work fairly well for patients that have bad hand osteoarthritis. Um, occupational therapy is helpful, more so than physical therapy, because they focus more on kind of dexterity and things like that. And then lastly, for hand osteoarthritis, something that a lot of my patients, at least anecdotally, have found helpful is paraffin baths. And so if, if you've been to like a nail salon where they do like the warm kind of wax soaks, um, you can actually buy these kind of paraffin kits for not too much money online. And a lot of patients find that to be helpful to continue doing at home. What is the dosage for the daily for Tylenol and the not steroids? What would you be the so for Tylenol, generally speaking, as long as you don't have a pre-existing liver condition and as long as you're not a big drinker of alcohol, um, you can take up to 3,000 milligrams of Tylenol in divided doses. And so usually like a Tylenol um, extra strength or arthritis is 500 milligrams in a tablet. So you can take up to two pills three times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, for example. So 3,000 um, 3,000 total, but in divided doses, assuming you don't have you know, a pre-existing kind of condition or something like that. Um, the doses for the NSAIDs are all different. Um, so for example, naproxen, you know, if you buy it over the counter, one pill is usually 220 milligrams. That yes, that's correct. And on the bottle, it says one pill twice a day. Yeah. Technically, you can take up to 500 milligrams twice a day, so roughly double that. But again, you know, that's assuming you're pretty healthy otherwise and don't have heart disease. And so the specifics really should be discussed with you know, a primary care doctor or someone else if you're going to be taking something consistently to make sure that it doesn't, um, you don't have a pre-existing condition that would change that recommendation and also to make sure that it doesn't interact with any of your other medications. So to take the one, you should take two at the same time. I'm sorry? <clears throat> so just if you just take, you're supposed to take two at the same time. For naproxen? Yeah. No, the, the bottle will say take one twice a day, right. morning and night time. If you have a doctor's permission, okay. we will say you can take up to two twice a day. Oh, okay, so you have to have doctor's permission. Yes. Does yes. diet have any impact on, uh, on arthritis? So, that's a good question. Um, I think the biggest way diet could impact arthritis is in the way it affects your weight, because <coughs> weight is such a big factor. Um, and so certain diets, you know, time and time again, you read these, you know, articles and the popular media about which diets are the healthiest, and recently there was some sort of ranking that like ranked Mediterranean as being very high, the DASH diet as being very high, those two tend to be always very high performing types of diets. And they're generally healthy for other reasons as well. As I mentioned, there may be some sort of link between osteoarthritis and heart disease. And both the DASH diet, which was originally created to treat patients with uh, high blood pressure, and the Mediterranean diet has cardiovascular benefits as well. And so it's, it's not going to hurt anyone with osteoarthritis if they wanted to try to implement some you know, aspects of those diets. Okay. One more question. Okay. I just thought I'd tell you about my experience with arthritis in my hand. I went to see a doctor, I went through all kinds of things, injections, ice, for months and months. Yeah. He explained to me that the problem was not where the pain was, uh -huh. but in the joint right there. Yes. And what I did, 
or an inspiration. It's like I had an electric massage. It applied it to that that section right there. It went away. Totally went away. My experience. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know, this massage, <laughs> uh, these physical things could probably help people with yeah. with arthritis. Yeah. So. What about acupuncture? <coughs> acupuncture I didn't mention, but it can be considered as an adjunctive um, non-pharmacologic therapy, and some patients do find it to be helpful, and I think insurances are you know covering it more and more, and a lot of pain clinics, that's kind of a multimodal approach is now offering acupuncture, so that's certainly something that can be tried. How does the paraffin bath work? It's just heat. Heat? It's just heat, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have to wrap it up right now, but I mean, I think you have to ask questions. questions. Yeah.